It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. My name is Mike Bernard, and with me in the KFG studios, my business partners and fellow CFPs, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. This year, two family child tax credits received some meaningful enhancements, but only for those that qualify. And so what are those tax credits and what are the changes and how can you maximize them? All that ahead on this hour of the Wise Money Show. That's right. And it's timely because we've got a couple more weeks left before the end of the year. And technically, there's some things that you could do to improve your chances of maximizing these credits before the end of the year. We're going to help you with that right now. If you have a question for the program, we'd love to hear from you. You can call or text 574 574- 222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. Online, wisemoneyshow.com. You can submit questions right there. And then, of course, all over uh, social media, whether that's YouTube, Facebook, wherever, just search the Wise Money Show. Submit questions there as well. All right. So just a little disclaimer. Okay. I don't know when you're absorbing this content. If you're listening to it on the radio, this is a pre-recorded show because of the holidays. Okay. And I think you'd understand that. Well, what the reason why I'm bringing that up is Right now, these tax credits that we're talking about were put in place for 2021 only. There's no way that they're going to keep it that way. I just, they're going to extend these things. Josh going, on, is giving, going on record there. Josh is giving me that look. It's very possible that they've extended them by the time you're listening to this. But at the time we're recording, which again is in advance, this is just for 2021 only. Um, so, Well, does that mean anything? Well, no, just make sure that you're doing tax planning, whether they extend them or not, make sure that you're, you're doing tax planning now. um, So we're talking about the changes with the child tax credit and the child independent care credits. Both of these, the whole point of the show, both of these sort of used to just be an autopilot. You got it. You got what you got and Mm -hmm. not much to do about it. Oh my goodness, guys, they have made in an attempt to enhance these and make these uh, credits richer, they've made it so much more complicated. Sure. And you're not going to be an expert in this by the end of the program. We're going to go through some details here in a moment. But but the point is to show if you're in certain circumstances, my goodness, you need to do planning for this. You need to do proactive planning if you've got young kiddos or if you're listening and say, I've got young grandkiddos, you got to tell your kids to listen. So, Or if you're listening and you're under 17... And you've got parents. Tell your parents to listen to the show. (laughs) Love it. Sure. Or under six. Uh, (laughs) And the reason why I say that is let's talk about the changes to the child tax credit. Let's start with that one. Josh, how did it used to work? Well, what era were you talking about Uh, here? My goodness. I mean, you, you think about child tax credits and... It wasn't that long ago that at, at the end of the year you got a six hundred dollar write off. Do you remember that? It was six hundred bucks a child, and then it went to a thousand, and then it went to two thousand, and now they're changing it again. But basically, the the reason we care so much about these credits is because they are credits. Credits are the very best part of a tax return because every dollar of credit that you get means it's a dollar less in taxes that you pay. So as far as tax write-offs go, this is this is kind of the cream of the crop, I guess. Yeah. And uh, now, is it enough to um, pay for having children? No. Uh, you know, th- these kids cost far more uh, than what the government gives you in tax savings, but it's a pretty lucrative deal these days. Uh, you know, just a year ago, for every child that you had under age 17, as long as your income didn't go too high, you were going to get $2,000 just knocked right off your tax bill. And by too high, it's $400,000 400, yep. for married filing jointly. And I, I don't remember the 600 child tax credit. I do remember the phase out, the income limit starting at 110. And that's where it was like, well, you know, as a married couple, if you're, if you're, both working, you weren't going to get a bunch mm-hmm. of child tax credit. Well, that changed. The child tax credit moved to $2,000 for ages zero up until the year they turned 17. And uh, for a married family jointly, you could have income all the way up to 400 and change, 1000 and still get it. Now, what did they do this year? Here's the change. Or Kevin, you want to hit the changes or you want me to keep rolling? You can keep rolling. All right. So now, 
if you have a child younger than age six, then that That's credit, the Bernards, that that credit is not two thousand. It's not three thousand. It's thirty six hundred bucks. Yeah. Okay. If you have a child age six to eighteen, they've now included seventeen year olds in this in this tax change, which. That's probably the only thing I like about this, by the way. Is it just on this extra thousand, or even the two? Even the two, I believe. Okay. Yeah, even even the two. Um, then your credit's not two thousand; it's three thousand. Okay. So those kiddos zero to five are worth thirty six hundred bucks now in tax <laughs> credit, <laughs> and for age six to seventeen, uh, up until eighteen, the year they turn eighteen, you don't get this. They're worth three grand. Uh-huh. But that would almost sound simple. Like that would be done. We'd be done with the show. However, in order to qualify for these extra benefits, your income needs to be below certain thresholds. And I've got in front of me just because I can't remember. If you're single, then in order to get those these higher amounts, your adjusted gross income needs to be below 75000 Married filing jointly, it needs to be below 150000 And if you say, well, I'm working or I sold some Bitcoin or what, I don't know. I've got some extra income this year. I'm going to be higher than that. Does this mean it goes away? Okay, if you're going to be higher than that, then this credit starts being reduced. Well, does it reduce all the way down from 3,600 or 3,000 to zero? No, it doesn't, because that would make sense. Um, <laughs> it gets reduced back down to the $2,000 level. Okay, and then it stays there for a long time until your income gets back. If it goes, your income goes all the way up to that 400,000 level, then it starts phasing out again and could drop all the way to zero. Make yeah, sense? The, the way that I've <laughs> tried to get this sorted out in my mind is the rules that applied last year really still apply because there's still a $2,000 tax credit. There's just an enhanced credit that's new this year. Again, uh, as of the, the time we're recording this show, um, we believe it's just for the year 2021. Nope. Mike's, Mike's Mike. going on record as saying it'll be here forever in <laughs> perpetuity. Um, I think that's what you said, right? Yeah. Uh, um, but so so the idea is if your income goes over $400,000, then you're in the exact same situation that you were a year ago with this exception being now your 17-year-old counts for you. Right. There is There's another exception, though. And that is some of this tax credit has already been paid to you. Yeah, good point. If they think you're eligible, and gosh, uh, we got a couple of extra minutes uh, of this segment we can share a little bit, but they've wanted to pay this tax credit to you on a monthly basis. Why? I believe it's because they want you to get used to receiving money every month from the government. I honestly do. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw that out there. I think they want you to get used to it. And so uh, they're paying this half of this child tax credit in advance on a monthly basis. Now, you could opt out of it. Um, I tried. Didn't work. They've, they've gotten, I have not heard anyone that's gotten just the exact right tax credit. I, I'm sure a lot of them are out there, but it seems like the IRS has gotten this more wrong than they've gotten it right. That's right. I've received a different dollar amount every single month. So, you know, this this is all over the place. It is a colossal mess. If you tried to opt out, probably you were unsuccessful. I haven't found anybody that's been successful either. So this is kind of a mess. And you need to be just aware they're essentially prepaying you a credit that you were going to originally take on your tax return. And you may have to pay some of that back. Maybe. This is all based on what they thought based on the previous year, you might not qualify for that amount anymore. That's right. That's and right. they're paying it to you already in advance. It's an absolute disaster. You can see now why we're spending extra time on this because planning, proactive planning needs to be involved because they've got additional um, benchmarks mm-hmm. for your income and so on. So now it's not just that because we've got to parlay this with the changes in the dependent care credit. So that and application coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here, YouTube. This is the Wise Money Show. What you're watching right now is our weekly one-hour talk show that airs right here on this channel at 10 a.m. Eastern Time every Saturday, also on podcast, and by the way, also on a couple radio stations, a few, three now, uh, in northern Indiana. Um If you're not interested in a full one-hour show, we've got additional content that 
drops on this channel all throughout the work week, eh, eight to 10 minute next wise step videos that take one financial concept, apply it directly to your financial life. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications. And if you like the content, like the content. And one last thing, leave a comment, leave a comment, ask a question, say something. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Dude, child, child independent I, care. Dude, I, I just listened for the most part to that last segment. This is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Who dreamed this mess up? D- dude, I am. I've had it up to here with this stuff. <laughs> good thing you're sitting down. <laughs> good, good thing it's going to be permanent. Like, yeah. Right, Mike? Oh, my word. <laughs> okay, just wait. Wait until we talk about this child independent care credit. I, this I, one was ridiculously stupid before. It was. And now they've made it a little more reasonable, but very lucrative. I know. I personally do like it's we don't have any money we have no money so just you i gotta qualify this statement with that and that is i sort of like what they did with this i think it's i think it's more applicable makes more sense but it only would make sense if you had money and we don't have any as, as a, a nation as a country yeah. yeah so let's get into it Are you going to maximize the rich benefits that are now part of the child and dependent care tax credit? It's very different than it was before. We're going to explain those changes right now and, and most importantly, help you get, get some ideas on how to maximize it yourself. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on podcast. Wherever you listen, go check it out. Search The Wise Money Show, subscribe to it, or follow us there. Rate the show there and leave comments. We appreciate it. All right, so if you think uh, if you think that the child tax credit is a doozy with what they did to that, I mean, the thing looks like Frankenstein now. It, it's just <laughs> <laughs> like you can't, it's uh, got parts This thing makes Frankenstein look <laughs> handsome. Okay, so <laughs> the child independent care credit you know, this is the thing. It used to not make any sense at all. Now it makes a little bit more sense, but my goodness, this could be that very generous. an enormous, enormous tax credit. So Josh, start filling in. How did this thing work? And let's Well, I think part of the reason why you're saying it never seemed to make sense is we just, you know, we were kind of surveying ourselves before the show. How often were you ever seeing anyone actually use this credit? Because most people get phased out of it so quickly because their income goes high enough that, you know, they, the government starts taking away this, this benefit. But uh, basically, if you've got kids under the age of 13 who need some sort of ongoing child care so that you can go work, you know, they, they go to um, daycare or, or something like that, um, the, the costs that you spend on that could could potentially qualify you for a tax credit. And like we said in the prior segment, tax credits are extremely lucrative for people because every dollar of tax credit saves you a dollar in tax. So you would want to know, do I qualify for this? Well, the, the reason why it wasn't all that hot in the past was it was only up to the first 35% of the money that you would spend on the child's uh, daycare and everything. Yep. But you quickly got it reduced down to 20% and very quickly after that just phased out completely. Again, all based on how high your income went. But it started so low. If your income was over 15000 they were already starting to take it away from you. All right, you, you lit the fuse. Here's the thing. <laughs> In order to get that maximum tax credit of 35%, your income needed to be below 15000 Okay, let me just add on to that. In order to even get the credit, though, you needed to be working full time. Who's working full time? Earning fifteen grand. Earning fifteen grand or less. But then that's not even it, because I'm not trying to judge here. What if that was your situation? Okay, that's that that's fine. Um, this credit is not refundable. Mm-hmm. And if your income is fifteen thousand or less, you pay zero tax. So you didn't even get this. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable how they wrote this thing. Uh, that's exactly right, and especially in recent years when uh, the standard deduction for a married couple, you know, ha- is up to twenty five thousand one hundred dollars this year. So, uh, as you said, if your income's that low, you've already raised all of your income because of just the free tax write offs that everybody gets. 
you're not getting any lift out of this. Thing. So, so this was essentially a tax benefit that applied to no one, and I and the IRS just was pat, or Congress was patting themselves on the back, saying, "Look at what we did! These great benefits that applied to zero people." The other thing that was just you know left in the 80s, really, with this tax, with the old tax credit, was it was up to the first three thousand that you spent on child care. Josh, I told you how much I spend on child care right. before. I'm not going to air it out. I'm just telling you for for if you've got young kids that need child care, this is the second largest expense in your monthly budget. There's there's no question about it. Um, and if you look at inflation, oh yeah, that thing we're all afraid of because the government printed trillions of dollars. Um, uh, if you look at inflation, the cost of child care or or um, daycare, whatever, has increased faster than tuition, wow. faster than tuition going back a couple decades. And so, yeah, like, so, so don't send your kids to daycare, send them to college. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's right. But it's sort of like, OK, the first three, <laughs> the first three grand on child care. Gee, thanks very little. You know, that that doesn't help at all. And so, and that's for one kid. If you have more than one child in daycare, then it's the first six grand. Then it was the first six grand. So, all right, that's how it used to work. For 2021, and I believe they will extend this moving forward, um, it's now the first 8,000 that you spend on child care per year, per person, okay? for So that's if you've got one kiddo. If you've got more than one kid in child care, then it goes up to 16,000. 16, right? And then... That maximum tax credit, instead of being 35%, it's 50%. Mm -hmm. And your, your income still needs to be below 15 grand. No, I'm just kidding. Your income <laughs> needs to be below, what is it here? 125,000. 125,000. So yeah. now it's actually going to apply to lots of folks, I believe. And you'll get a better credit, not 35%, you'll get 50%. And not of three grand, it'll be of eight or 16. And did you already say it's refundable and it's now? Refund I, had, I hadn't said that. So, so this credit can take your overall tax bill down to zero and then even take it negative to where you know, you're paying no tax and the government's still sending you a refund. Uh, Kevin uh, doesn't like it when I say that's free money to you because it's not free. It's taken from one person's pocket or many people's pockets and sent to you. But that's a pretty sweet deal if you're the one receiving a refundable credit. That's right. And so if you've got two kids um, that are in daycare or child care, then and your expenses go up to 16000 and you're below this $125,000 threshold, you're going to get an $8,000 tax credit. Will that wipe out all of your tax? I mean, if, if your income's 125000 and you've got child independent care expenses, I, I think they only apply for kids younger than age 13. So oh, I was going to say they've, they've actually raised it to age 30 now. Uh, it's amazing <laughs> that you can send your kids to daycare at 29 and uh, it's, uh, it's good, fantastic. man. But between the child tax credit that you'll get if your income is that low and because you've got youngsters and this tax credit, I mean, you won't be paying any tax. Uh -huh. And so in just a moment, we're going to apply this to you. And, and so but we've got to add in this this additional piece. What if your income's above that 125 limit? Well, then that that um, amount of your credit starts being reduced. That's right. It gets phased out like so many other areas of the tax code. As your income goes up, you get less and less of this credit, and it's completely gone by the time you get to $400,000. That's right. It will go down to, it drops, 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 until that 20% threshold. And that 20% threshold, if my numbers are correct in front of me, but numbers don't translate well over the radio, you're not going to remember this. It's fine. 125000 up to 183000 That's when that phase out is occurring. But then from 183000 all the way to 400000 in income, you get a 20% credit. And if you're listening saying, okay, snooze, you know, I got 20% previously. No, no, no. It's 20% of this eight grand. Yeah. Not 20% number. Not 20% of three grand. That's so right. I... This is another one of those places in the tax code where you're like, why, why can't they just be consistent? You know, in our last segment, we were talking about the child tax credits and who gets phased out of that and at what income levels and everything. Why can't they use the same income levels to apply across the board and keep it simple? I know. I, we're, we are in desperate need of simplicity here. Before these tax law changes, remember when a former president was going to try and make the tax code more simple? You'll be able to do 
your taxes on a on a postcard postcard <laughs> well that was yes we can laugh at that because we, we there were some changes pushed out that did not make the 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 tax return shorter or simpler but things have just again gone frankenstein there's since. a meaning, meaningful distinction without a difference yeah that's that's exactly <laughs> that right. was what was created all right so the point of this show was not to make you experts uh, you're not going to be able to remember these numbers over the radio waves that's fine the point is to 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 recognize you now need to do proactive tax planning to maximize these benefits, okay? And that's what we're going to help you with in just a moment. What things can you do right now to make sure that you get the most from these enhanced, richer benefits? That and more coming up on The Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. It's unbelievable. I can't believe we got through that. And this is our second show about this. We we did one of these back after it was passed in April or May, I think. And huh. yeah, was I? A, I don't think I was a part of that. I don't show. know. It, Maybe Ryan was on or something. Well, Maybe. Th- this is this is what I think about when these when these new concepts or, or changes get rolled out, and I struggle to understand them, mm-hmm. and then I really really wrestle with how to. Take, apply it or explain yeah, it apply or it. and 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 then what are the planning opportunities so when it when when i when i find myself struggling i'm like wait a minute i do this for a living yeah if this is what you do for a living and it's it it makes you cross eyed mm-hmm. i i cannot imagine if you were just saying well i'm going to use turbotax and see what i can do oh i know totally so, okay all right so so now it's just how do you reduce your agi Right, because I, I think we've got to emphasize why those thresholds are so important, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Because that's what TurboTax can't do. Exactly. It's not going to tell you, hey, you know, you, it, it's going to say you're getting this amount of credit. It's not telling you you could have had this if you had just done one or two things a little differently. That's exactly right, 100%. So. All right. So, yeah, so, because every, we'll talk about the things that you don't do and the things that you do do. Yeah, that's okay. right. Do do, uh, third segment. Wait, is it? Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, third. Okay. Okay. What what can you do, or what can your kids for grandkids do to maximize these wildly enhanced family tax credits that are in place for 2021? We're helping you with that right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Stay up to date on all Wise Money content. Find us online, wisemoneyshow.com, and then all of our social media. Search the Wise Money Show. Find us there. Submit questions there. Stay up to date. All right? Okay, so we broke down these just wildly complicated tax credits that are for the benefit of families. Trust me, we're not making them complicated so you get less out of it. (laughs) Wink, 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 wink. This is for you. Um, So complicated. The point of the show is how can you maximize those? And there are things that you can do to make sure that you stay in that 50% threshold for the for the child independent care credit. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? What if you were just sort of uh, asleep at the wheel or just, you know, on autopilot and you did your taxes and you were a thousand dollars away from having a richer tax benefit? A thousand dollars and you could have done something different. Right. So what can you do? How does this work where you can maximize these credits well okay so there's there's really maybe three groups that we need to pay attention to here because if if you're falling into an income range where you're starting to get phased out of certain benefits then the name of the game ultimately is what can you do proactively to bring your income back down into the right range yep and that involves trying to reduce your income using strategies like contributing to pre-tax retirement accounts. Maybe you've heard us say on this show all the time how much we love the Roth IRA, and a Roth IRA does not save you any money in taxes in the year that you make a contribution. It doesn't help reduce your income, but a traditional IRA might, or your traditional 401k. So you might actually be in an income range where the the advice that we would give shifts from a Roth IRA back to a traditional. That's right. But you have to know that so far in advance because you need plenty of time throughout the year to 
to be able to take advantage of these things. HSA contributions would mm -hmm. be another one. We've talked a lot about health savings accounts because you can throw money into this account pre-tax. It helps reduce your income, in other words, gives you a tax write-off, and maybe could be just enough to help make you eligible for one of these credits that we've been talking about for this show. So yeah, there are three camps and let's start with the most important one. And that is those of you that listened to those, those income thresholds and you're close, you, you're, you, you think you might have income as a married couple near that 125 or maybe near that 150 threshold. Because again, like Josh said, these are, these are similar credits for the same people. It's for mm -hmm. families. It's for those of you that have kids and these are different income limits here. Um, so if you're close, oh my goodness, yeah, you, you've got you, you've got to consider IRA as opposed to Roth. You've got to consider pre-tax 401k as opposed to Roth 401k, and you've got to consider maxing out that HSA, maxing out that HSA if you have an HSA eligible high deductible health plan. Max that HSA and, to get that income. And this, down. this is why you want to work with a pro who can coach you through the trade offs and show you. I look, if you took an extra $5,000 here, it's going to result in $3,000 of tax savings over here. Is that worth it to you? And a lot of times the answer would be yes, because that to put $5,000 someplace uh, only cost me two. Exactly. Right, right, exactly. Right. But the other message here, though, is not not only what can you do to make sure you stay eligible, what can you avoid doing to make sure you don't blow it too, right? right? But because we're we're often talking about. In fact, we even just had a show recently about things that you should be doing at the end of before the end of the year to to make a wise tax move or a, a wise financial move. And one of them that we often talk about is a Roth conversion. You know, Roth conversion is shifting money from an IRA to a Roth IRA, but it adds income to your tax return. And what if you, being as proactive as we always coach you to be, and, and trying to think way down the road about having more money that's tax-free in retirement, you take action and do a Roth conversion and you don't even realize, oh, boy, I just increased my income now to a level that I just gave up a bunch of tax credits, mm -hmm. or I reduced the goodness of those credits. If you ask me where, and, and Josh, you're talking about things that you should not do. So maybe one of the things I should not do is do any kind of sales in, in, in my investment accounts where I've got gains because uh, if I'm at that income level, I'm likely going to pay taxes, capital gains taxes on those gains. Uh, could even be worse, those gains, if they're short-term, could be taxes, yep. ordinary income. Yeah. But to me, if you said, where's the opportunity for someone who's listening today, I'd say if you're listening today and you're self-employed, I'm, I, if especially if you're self-employed and doing your own tax return, I can almost guarantee you there are things that you should be deducting on your tax return that you're not, and so you need to go through with a fine-tooth comb and say where, what are the opportunities for me to reduce, whether it's the home office deduction, whether, I mean, there are so many things that you could likely take advantage of that you're likely not. And and this becomes a confidence game. Because mm -hmm. if you don't know the tax code inside and out, there is there is a lot of gray area here. And there's a lot of like old legacy knowledge that's used by tax preparers. And they're saying, well, don't do the home office deduction because that's a red flag for an audit and i'm like look dude uh, yeah no no it's not and i mean that that's an inherent risk also when you're relying on the advice of someone who is only looking at your financial life through just one set of lenses you know they're just looking at the tax ramifications to me this is a perfect example of why it's so important that your tax planning be part of one overall plan that we call a financial plan. It has to be a comprehensive approach. You need to be looking at all the corners of your financial life to determine whether or not that strategy that makes sense for so many people actually applies in your situation. Because you could take a really good move and make it a horrible one if you apply it the wrong way, or you could take a good move and make it a great one if you apply it just right in your situation. And that's where you know, you, you can only distinguish the difference between those outcomes by looking at your overall financial plan. Preach it. Uh, uh, amen. Right. So 
Okay, if you're close to those income thresholds, m get deductions. Find above the line deductions, IRA, 401k, HSA. Avoid adding more taxable income. Um, so be careful with uh, with Roth conversions or selling items in non-taxable accounts. And if by golly, if you're a small business owner or self-employed, make sure you're capturing all your deductions, okay? Uh, all right. Now, what about the second camp of you? If you're way below those thresholds, if you're way below those thresholds, I don't think you're going to pay any tax this year. I don't. So then you better Roth it. Roth it. My goodness. And if you have a simple IRA and there's no Roth available to you, then you better only put 3% in that simple so you get the full match and then fund your Roth after that. Mm -hmm. Because I just, guys, I, and again, you, you guys laugh at me when I do math on the show. <laughs> Are you about to? <laughs> no. Hang on, I'm, I'm, just saying, I'm just this. saying, if you're below that threshold where you're going to get that 50% credit for, for child independent care, you're not going to pay any tax. I just, I don't see how you would. Now, what if you're in that well above uh, income camp? Where listen, the way you and your spouse uh, earn income, you're gonna two hundred thousand, two two fifty, something like that. Then there's probably not much you could do to get yourself down below those thresholds, but you then need to be watchful of that four hundred thousand. You mm -hmm. say, yeah, well that'd be nice. Well, you could easily get there if you sell the wrong thing, you do a Roth conversion, something like that, and so you've got to be watchful for that other side as well. Yeah, and if you're in that income range. Uh, every write-off that you can come up with is extra beneficial to you because it may recapture a little bit of credit as well as the normal tax savings. That's that's exactly right. The big point here is these take this takes these helpful tax credits and now moves them to proactive planning. You got to do that proactive plan exactly the way Josh said. All right, we've got questions from fans of the show. That and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. All right. Good. So, dude, you channeled the late, great Norm MacDonald. Uh-oh. Did you hear him? By golly. By uh -oh. golly. Oh, my <laughs> word. I, 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 I closed my eyes. I'm like, oh, Norm's still here. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. Yep. By golly. All right. Questions from fans of the show. Let's, let's hit those, uh, those newer ones at the bottom. Not Gonzalo's, but we'll start with Bill's. Bill, Kathy, Trisha. Let's do it. Let's do it. Right. I th I just have to say that those three segments will probably go down as the worst three segments of the year, quite possibly oh, ever. It. Dude, it's terrible. That stuff is so terrible. Like, I don't even want the, those words to be on our, come out of our mouth. Mm -hmm. Like, we should not, like, we should be banished from even talk. We should cancel ourselves for talking about that stuff. It's so, it's so terrible. I know. I, like, why do you, I, okay. People need help. I mean, if you got oh, kids. Oh, my word. If you have kids, oh. you need help. You need help. I need help. I'm a financial planner trying to help people and I need help. That's crazy. My stinking word. Crazy. All right, here we go. Okay. Four segment, land on the plane. Let's do it. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name, hey, I just said that twice. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on the YouTube channel. You got some extra content there between segments. Also, next wise step videos that air all throughout the week. So go to YouTube, search the Wise Money Show, and, uh, and follow us there. Subscribe to it and turn on notifications so you're made aware every time we drop new content. Thank you very much. Okay, Kevin Kevin said those first three segments will probably go down as three of the worst ever in Wise Money Show history. I, I disagree. However, it's unfortunate that they've made this thing so complicated. I, I mean, you want it simple. You want to bless people, you want to benefit people, and you yeah. need it to be simple. Because of the content. That content is all ridiculous. I mean, it is, it, it's <laughs> off the charts. Absurd. <laughs> wow. All right. Bye, Dude. golly. All right. Ridiculous. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there, that 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 comes out of either a children's book or cartoons. So you, it, uh, I don't know. Okay. I think that might be Tigger, who says that. <laughs> oh yeah. T i double go. Sounds, -er. like, sounds like something you'd yeah. say. All right. Uh, <laughs> got some. Have have a long list of questions in the queue here, and we're gonna start with one submitted on the YouTube channel from Bill. Great question here. Does a 403B, I have a tax sheltered annuity, I believe is what he's saying here. 
have an optional Roth as well, like the Roth 401k. Um, or it's, I think he says, or an IRA Roth. Okay, so d- does a 403b come in pre-tax and Roth as well? I mean, it depends on uh, whether your employer offers it, right? Okay, so here's the thing. I, the, Kevin and I were just talking about this. <laughs> I saw something, I think it was a couple of years ago, that suggested all new plans or what is it, Kevin? Plans need to be benchmarked every three years or rewritten every three or six years? Every, yeah, like every, every, every six years a plan needs to be restated yeah. because if I have a plan, as time goes on, Congress and and the government continuously updates the rules. Well, by the very fact that I had this plan six years ago, my plan is now out of compliance. Mm -hmm. So you've got a certain amount of time to get into compliance and have your plan restated. And one of those areas of compliance that I was convinced of was, well, you got to have, you got to offer the Roth. The Roth has an option. Now, apparently that's not true. I know I read it or I dreamt about it. (laughs) <laughs> but apparently that is yeah. not true. But to me, I'm just thinking, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you ever add a Roth component? And and the reason you wouldn't is if you have the wrong 401k advisor, I mean, basically. Yeah, but, you, you put your plan in place ages ago and you really haven't revisited it. And, and this would be employers doing this, right? So yeah. you as the employee, you don't have a choice on whether or not they add this feature or when they go restate their plan or anything. You're just counting on them staying in compliance, doing their, their job to keep a great benefit in front of you. And to your point, Mike, why wouldn't an employer offer this? Because it's not like it costs them really anything. It's just making more options available to your your employee base. Yeah, I, I, this I could easily get get on a soapbox about all of this stuff because they, when you look at a four hundred one k, a four hundred one k is almost like having a. a its own business in and of itself. It can mm-hmm. take on a life of its own. It doesn't have to, but it can if you're not careful. So if you make widgets, you might have two other businesses beyond the widget making. You might have the health, health insurance, insurance. The oh. health insurance business that you have to run, and you might have the retirement plan business that you have to run. So there are ways to streamline that, and you can actually have a a named fiduciary. You can do all kinds of really cool stuff to take that responsibility. But in and you know, this is like, well, why wouldn't everyone do it? I don't know. Yeah, I don't why know. when I talk to a business owner and we ask him how it's going with this 401k provider and he says, well, I don't know. I asked him to come out and provide employee education and they won't do it. It's mm-hmm. like, how yeah. how does that how does that provi- provider not get fired immediately? Okay. So so this is what I would tell you. I would say it is it's optional and it's legacy stuff if you don't have it. Speaking of legacy, yeah. now that we've been talking about 401k, 403b, same thing. I mean, you can do Roth 403b. Yes. Um, however, 403bs have been very unique. They, they, you might think of them as the, um, as the sibling to the 401k, just for nonprofits. It's more like the step sibling because there's there's different rules at times with the 403b and going way back legacy type stuff. A lot of 403bs used to have used to be structured as tax sheltered annuities (TSAs). Mm-hmm. Now, if your if your employer is still offering a tax sheltered annuity, I don't think they're going to be offering a Roth. Like that seems mm-hmm. like ancient. So if, if I'm a betting man, so Bill, the answer is they should offer the Roth. Go check. But the simple fact that you said 403B and then in parentheses said TSA, I'm going to guess they don't have an optional Roth. Yeah. But Bill tucked in just a few words more on the end of his question also. He said, neither is an I, is a Roth IRA either, right? So like he, he's basically saying the Roth IRA is a totally separate animal than the Roth 401k or Roth 403B. And that's exactly right. You could actually have both, potentially. If your employer will let you contribute to a Roth 403b, and you also choose on your own to contribute to a Roth IRA, you can get a lot of money squirreled away for retirement in these tax-free accounts. And you might say, well, 
yeah, the, the bucket's so big, I don't have that much income to, to put towards this. Well, sometimes, you know, if you've got earned income, we, we've seen a lot of folks who at the edge of retirement, they're able to stuff lots of money into these plans because maybe you received an inheritance or maybe you had some sort of a windfall and you've got some already taxed money that you want to get stuffed away into these types of retirement plans. Your certified financial planner can help you determine which ones are you eligible for and how does it fit in your overall game plan for your financial life? Yeah. Good, good question. And, you know, I would just add in a public service service announcement, this IRA or pre-tax or Roth, it's an annual decision. Mm -hmm. It's an annual decision that if you're working with a CFP that's doing comprehensive financial planning, they're automatically thinking about that for you. And they might not even tell you, oh, hey, by the way, I evaluated it again for you this year. Continue doing what you're doing. Um, Especially based on the first three segments of the show. Oh, yeah, right. So you've got to make this an annual decision. Am I still doing the right thing or do I, do I need to switch it? Okay, Kathy, uh, also on the YouTube channel. I'm disabled, but I have a Roth account and I'm reinvesting the interest in that account. Fun, Wonderful. That's what you should be doing. I'm 55 years old and a widow. Is there a maximum that I can put in? I just hearing this, Kathy, it sounds like, yeah, you had some circumstances in life that yeah, are that are rough. Same. I'm sorry to hear that. And therefore, you know, having a wise approach with your finances, I would argue, is even more critical, right? You might not have as much margin and room for error. So um, there's two ways to get money into a Roth. There's a contribution. Uh, Kevin, I'll have you share that. Or a Roth conversion. Contribution, though, disability income in and of itself wouldn't necessarily qualify. What are those rules? Yeah, it has to be earned income. And again, there's really no way to get there from here. You just have to know what the rules are and how to apply them to Mm -hmm. your situation. So Kathy, if your only source of income is disability income, that wouldn't qualify uh, to uh, uh, make you eligible to contribute. So Mm -hmm. if I'm, if you're going to contribute, if you had uh, $6,000 of income, earned income. Wages, wages paycheck wages, money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, on, was that line seven or whatever? But anyway, so I have that. I can contribute that. Now, if I'm 50 plus, I can do an extra thousand. So I could do 7,000. Yeah. Now, the, the thing that's interesting, and this is the tricky thing about getting a question on YouTube, we don't know all of the details of the situation, so we can only uh, surmise. But when you say you're reinvesting the interest, that to me sounds like that might be in a CD or some sort of an interest-bearing vehicle. And Kathy, that might be super appropriate for your situation. But if you look at the impact of taxes and inflation, if it's if it's in some sort of fixed income investment vehicle, it's likely not going to keep up with the impact of taxes and inflation. Uh, And that's not just an overarching attempt to say, be an investor, not a saver. I would actually say that's connected to the type of vehicle that the Roth IRA is. It's like buying a Porsche when you just really need a golf cart. Like the Roth IRA is built for speed. (laughs) It is built for tax-free growth. And if you put it in an investment, or, or if you put an investment within it, that's really not going to have tax-free growth and not have a lot of growth. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's got to sit with your overall financial plan and, and your peace of mind and all of that. But that's a helpful comment, Kevin. All right. Uh, next question here comes from Trisha as well from the YouTube show. You know, if we had a fourth child, it was a girl, I, I'd love the name Trisha. Oh, I've always loved it. Trish. I don't know. Hmm. We've got a Carrington as well, so that's uh, love love that name. But Trisha, thanks for the question. Would it be wise to jump into the twenty two percent bracket if you find yourself always near the top of the twelve percent tax bracket? What do you guys think? You love the name. I love the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you want do you want to hit this one, Kevin, or do you want me to? Oh, give give it a give shot. it a go. Yeah. Uh, you, you know the the answer is, of course, it depends. Um, just like almost every tax related question, it seems. But uh, does it make sense to jump into the 22% bracket? I say it depends because it's a question of, are you going to be in an even higher tax bracket out in the future? And is the 22% bracket still a good deal for you when you look at your overall lifetime amount of taxes that you may end up paying? 
And uh, certainly there are events that can cause you to jump into a higher tax bracket in the future. And one of them is a really sad, somber one to even think about, but it could be losing a spouse. If you are always at the edge of the 12% bracket, almost jumping into the 22% bracket, and you lose your spouse, all of a sudden you may forever always be in the 22% bracket because you, you, the, the rates that you end up paying, they get um, certainly more painful, I guess, for those who are filing a single tax return than those who are paying um, on a joint tax return. So. There are some events that might cause you to say, hey, I may as well go ahead and start paying, prepaying the tax on some of this money now in the 22% bracket, and that's not the end of the world. Keep in mind also, a lot of people are confused about how the tax brackets actually apply. If you jump into the 22% bracket, it doesn't mean that all of your income now suddenly gets 10% more expensive or there's a, a, another 10% bite out of it. No, it's only those dollars that spill into the 22% bracket that are taxed more heavily. All your earlier income is still taxed at either 10% or 12%, depending on which bracket it falls into. So many other uh, financial shows would look at this question and say, well, it depends. Well, it certainly does depend on your comprehensive financial plan. Uh, the circumstances, so Josh, you laid them out. That was very helpful. Like if you, if, if the first three seconds of this show, Tricia, apply to you, uh, probably not. Probably not. Then, mm -hmm. then you've got to make sure that you're staying below those levels so you can get uh, as much of those tax credits as possible. But if your income is set to grow in the future, I don't mind going into the 22% bracket or even filling it up, honestly. I, I really don't. So, all right. Thanks for the questions, everyone. That is all the time we have for today. On behalf of Josh Gregory, Kevin Corhorn, and all of us at KFG, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.